real quiet, if you get real quiet and I start to ramble on, if I start to ramble, we're going to be here forever. Woo! Praise the Lord. Somebody's on board with me. I was sharing this morning that uh, we, I wasn't feeling good earlier this week, but my, my doctor gave me permission to be here, so I'm doing fine now. Uh, <laughs> you guys all know Dr. Scott. She took the phone line, so. I was joking around about that this morning. People don't know the burden I have to carry. When you live in the house with a medical provider, she scrutinizes everything that you do. So if I'm getting for that piece of candy that I know I need, she's like, no. Um, she has cut me back on sugar. I'm only allowed to have five pounds a day now, so a lot of things that she's really scrutinizing now in my life. But, uh, <laughs> but God has been good. I wanted to share with you for a while this morning. Um, we started on on uh, watch night service, and I wanted to kind of continue that on because most of you weren't here for watch night service. A bunch of lazy guys and gals. I just how many people want to sleep early? So. So I have a real quick question for you. How many people believe that children need to be taught the Bible? Yes. yes. Amen. Wendy, I want you to take note of all those names that are volunteering for Sunday school to help the children to learn. Amen? Now if I ask this again, I can say how many people like the music and, and all that stuff to be the right levels and tuned in. If I ask you to raise your hand, now nobody's going to raise their hand. But, uh, you know, really, be involved in your church. And that's part of what we're going to talk about tonight, uh, today, is uh, about having a vision. I, and I, I talked about this on, on watch night service. As we begin the beginning of the year, I, I thought it was a great privilege that the pastor asked me to be able to fill in for him today. Because it is the first Sunday that we have of this, of this new decade. Boy, I tell you what, I, that surprises me every time I think of that, the new decade. I never thought I'd live past 21, and now we're talking decades. So God has been good, but God instills with us, within us a vision, and that's what I want to talk about this morning. If you're looking at a title on this, it would be Cisterns or Living Water. For those that don't know what a cistern is, it's a big round hole in the ground that you pump water out of, and I'll explain that more as we go along. But we need to look forward to our walk that we have with God. We need to have a vision in this walk with God. There's a vision that God wants to instill in your life to lead you forward. In Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, I'm going to read it twice. Once from the King James and once from the American Standard Version. First one says, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. In the American Standard Version, it says, where there is no vision, the people cast off for strength. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. The idea is, is that when we don't have a vision or a direction in our life, we kind of cast caution to the wind. We really don't, we're like, we're like a bunch of puppies. I saw somebody show me a, a video the other day that was just hilarious. This puppy, they put out a bowl of food. So the puppy jumped into the food, and what does the food do? It goes every which direction. And so now it's running around trying to find each piece of the food. The whole time the bowl was still full. And sometimes when we don't have a vision, we, we really don't get anywhere. We really don't do anything. It, we become those people like sponges. I, I jokingly say that I've had a membership in, in a weightlifting gyms for five years, and they haven't done me one ounce of good. And then I've been constantly being told by my, my wife that I actually have to go. Um, but, you know, by osmosis, I should take and get in shape, shouldn't I? I have the card with me. So sometimes we treat our Christianity that way. We say that we believe in the Bible. We believe in what God's telling us because we carry the Bible with us. And therefore, by osmosis, we should be fantastic Christians. Yes. It doesn't quite work that way. I, I've known people that were atheists that could quote more of the Bible than I could quote. Just knowing the Word of God and just going to church does not make you a Christian. The Bible tells us that Christian is Christ-like. And then you stop and you begin to break down exactly what that means. I've got to tell you, most of us, please don't take this as an offense, but most of us fall short of the mark. Amen? 
And so that's what we want to talk about this morning is about having a vision. A vision comes from an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our spiritual walk that we have with God. It isn't something that we can contain, but a vision must push forth like a spring of living water. Now where this message comes from is from part of my childhood back in the, back in the, the eastern part of the states, back in the big town of, our uh, big city or uh, big state of Indiana, get it right here in a minute. <laughs> Tell that why I can't talk, because I come from Indiana. I was born here and raised there for a while and it affected me terribly. Um, it took my poor wife 10 years to get my English straightened up so that people could understand me. But um, one of the things we learned back in Indiana is there's, uh, Indiana is there's two types of wells. You have one that was a spring. A spring could not be altered. You could put a wall around it to make it deeper so that you could pull more water out of it. But you could not alter the spring itself because if you did, it would collapse and destroy it. And water would no longer come forth. You had to take it was. The other type of well was what they call a cistern. And anybody from the south knows what a cistern is. That is a big hole in the ground that they dig deep and then all this water and stuff comes into it. Now, let me just share with you that water is not the only thing that comes into it. Um, if you're from those areas, you know that about once a year, once every other year, we, we pump them out and we clean them out. Because things get in there. And you end up cleaning the bottom of the well and you'll find rats and bugs and all kinds of fun items. Especially when you realize you've been drinking from this for the last year. And washing in it and washing your clothes in it. And uh, it just it brings out a whole new experience in your life that you didn't really want to have. But sometimes we as Christians need to decide which one we are. So let's look at that. Old wells. In John chapter 4 verses 5 through 10... We find where Jesus goes into Samaria. It says, So he came to the city of Samaria, which is called Sichar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And then the woman of the Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, asks for a drink from me, a Samarian woman? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samarians. And Jesus asked and said, answered and said unto her, If you knew the gift of God, who, is, who it is that says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Now this passage doesn't sound, I mean, it's profound because Jesus is the living water. But let me give you the real context for this. If you looked at Genesis chapter 33, verses 19 to 20, it says, and he brought, we're talking about Jacob now, and he bought a parcel of ground which he had pitched his tent from the children of Hamar, Shishem's father, for 100 pieces of money. And then he erected an altar there and called it, and I cannot pronounce it, but it means God, the God of Israel. And here's what's really fascinating. That's the well that Jesus is sitting at right now. Now Jesus is God with us. The well means the God of Israel. So you have Jesus Christ, God who is with us, sitting at the well, the God of Israel, talking to this woman. Now there's some interesting things about this. So Jesus is saying here, you're drinking from a cistern. I'm the living water. What makes it interesting is what you begin to look at with a cistern, because a cistern does not produce its own water. So therefore, things have to seep into the well. As I just explained to you, not only water seeps into the well. But it's affected by its climate. It's affected by the amount of water that's around the area. That's how what's going to go in there. Here, now here's what really, and I don't mean to gross anybody out, but let's just be honest. If you've got an outhouse not that far away, you guys kind of see where I'm going with some of this. Some of this stuff doesn't sound that great, but here's the reason I bring this up. How many times as we as Christians do we live more of a cistern kind of a life than we do a living water life? In other words, my attitude about God depends on how everybody in the church is doing. Did the pastor preach a good message? Well, maybe not today, so therefore I'm just not spiritually enthused. Did I go to work and everything at work just hasn't gone right? Oh, well, you know. 
And I watch Christians become what I call roller coaster Christians, where they're they're happy, they're sad, they're happy, they're sad, they're happy, they're sad, they're happy, they're sad. And there's no consistency. The problem is, is the Bible never stopped that. If there was ever a man who wouldn't have had consistency, it would have been Paul. And yet I read more about the joy of God through Paul than any other person. And yet, you read Paul, there's a man that could have grumbled. I, I've shared this before, but I, I still, I, I laugh a lot about things in the Bible. Because you've got Paul, he just gets done with a shipwreck. He just gets done floating three days in the sea. He gets to land and tries to help build a fire, and then he gets snake bit. Oh, sign me up for the ministry of Paul. And yet Paul rejoiced in the Lord. They get beat, put into the lowest part of the, the dungeon, and what do they do? Well, they were normal Christians, so they complained and said, God, why me? Why did you do this to me? And, and God, why are you so hard on me? Is that what they did? What I read is that they begin to sing the praises of God. You see, the difference is Paul was not a sister in spiritual life. He was tapped into a living force of God that flowed through him, despite the outward conditions of what was going on around him. And that's what I'm trying to show you this morning, is that when we begin talking about a vision that we have for God, stepping into some form of ministry, because the fact of it is, is every person here is called by God into ministry. Now here's what's fascinating to me. You're either ministering the glories of God, are you ministering against God? Amen. And you understand what I'm saying here? If all your neighbor ever hears from you is how bad everything is, boy, they really want to go to that, that God, don't they? If all they ever hear is all the problems that you ever have, then where's the glory of God at? I don't want my life to be constantly affected by whether or not I have a new vehicle to drive. I don't want to be affected by the numbers in my bank account or the lack of numbers in my bank account. I heard a comedian the other day said he was sitting at the bank and, and he says, I had like a negative income, so I'm talking with the cashier trying to help work this thing out. He says, and I don't know what possessed me. I asked her out for a date. And he says, it dawned on me, this woman sees my whole financial history. And she went, <laughs> no. You ever had somebody look at you as a Christian and after listening to you for the last week, but no. <laughs> Amen. What is the vision that you have? If we're not careful, like I said, it's a cistern kind of a thing. We hope to take and absorb God by os osmosis in the church that the people around me will hopefully encourage me. If I have the Bible sitting close to a table that I pass by occasionally, I would just absorb scripture. <laughs> now, you laugh, but it's, you guys don't know, as a pastor in the past, I, I've gone to people's homes, and I find more dust sitting on their Bibles than any place else. And people, we kind of play this game. And we want a vision from God. We want a vision of drive us forward, but a vision does not come by just holding and waiting out. So we have to look beyond that. Psalms chapter 63. Well, let, me, let me give you a quote here that I love. It's by William Barclay. He explains really how you get a hold of God. He says, so, so often we have kind of a vague, wistful longing that the promises of Jesus should be true. The only way to really enter into them is to believe them with the clutching intensity of a drowning man. Think about that for a moment. What is it in your life that you desperately need? And I have people tell me, oh, I desperately need this or that, but then you watch the actions that they take, and it's really not that desperate. You know, we have to begin to apply Psalm 63 Verses 1 and 2 says this, O God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked to you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. There's a place that we're going to have to get. If we want to see this church affected, and, and I've been talking to Pastor about this, and, and he didn't give you guys a vision for the church yet. 
That's the next thing. But, and we talked about this stuff. And he said, I want the people in the church to get a vision for their life first. He said, because really, if we set up a vision for the church, but nobody has a vision for the personal life, you know what happens? We have a vision for the church and nothing really goes forward. Your vision in your personal life affects the family of God. Would you agree with that? Amen. Because guess what? It's hard to drag a dead corpse. It's much easier when they're walking with you. Amen? Amen. We have to have this reality that as the body of Christ, we must be alive and thriving. But that only happens when we as individuals have a vision in our life to not only affect our house, this body, but to affect those out there. That is a mission field that we affect every single day that we step out of here. Every time that we enter into the gas station or the grocery store or the neighborhood, wherever we're at, we affect that. But do we have the vision for that? Because until we have the vision that breaks our hearts for those around us, you will never reach them. Paul said, that, as unto the Jews I became a Jew, unto the slave I became a slave. And he went on down. He met them where they were because his heart cried out for them. What's interesting is everything that Paul's training told him to stay away from the Gentiles. Everything about Paul told him that. But God gave him a different vision. And at times it even came in conflict with others that were called Christians. But you need to have a vision in your life, and this starts with living water. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, God was speaking to the church, and, and he had a problem with them. He said this, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountains of living water, and they have hewn for themselves cisterns, cisterns that can hold no water. You see, a cistern, when it just holds water, it begins to evaporate. I gotta tell you, if you haven't been around a cistern in the middle of about August, you don't know how much you really don't want to take a shower. Because they sit there and they've kind of percolated and they, they, they're just not great. And unfortunately in Indiana, when you take a shower, you get out and you're trying to dry off, but you're sweating faster than you can dry, so it really doesn't help anyway. But. He was looking at, the, at his people, though, and he says, listen, here's the reality. I am the living water. How many people know that Jesus Christ is the living water for your life? Amen. Amen. How many people know that you need to have the living of the Holy Spirit in your life? Amen. How often are we seeking for the fullness of both of those? We need to be doing it daily, but we need to be doing it, in my opinion, minute by minute, hour by hour. We live in a day and age where I gotta tell you, there is something that is desperately needed in our life. John chapter 7, verse 37 and 39 said this. And in the last days of the great feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. What's he saying? We have the Holy Spirit and we like to get excited in church. But there's a depth that we often overlook. It doesn't just happen in church. It has to go beyond this place. Amen? Amen. I, I wish I could explain to you the power of the Holy Spirit that we often lack in. And, and it's amazed me that Christians have just sort of become to this place where we're like, okay, we're happy. And we're satisfied, and that's all we need. <coughs> My Bible maybe reads a little different than yours. Mine says that the Holy Spirit does miracles. There's prophecy, there's tongues and interpretations, there's words of knowledge, there's gifts of healing, there's, and there's a whole list of them. And if you try to limit them, Here's the funny thing about the Holy Spirit. You can't. We can say, well, there's all these right here that were listed. Well, actually, if you begin to go through the Bible, you keep finding new ones. 
So, do you want miracles in the church? Do you want healings in the church? Do you want prophecy, tongues and interpretation? Do you want this? <coughs> Some are like, well, maybe. Yes. He's, he's giving us a loaded question. The fact of it is, is that we often say, yes, we want that in church, but we never think of ourselves as being the one vital element that's needed for that to be in the church. Amen? Amen. I'm always like, you know, let somebody else pray for it. When I was in seminary, when I first went to seminary, I remember God called me to be a pastor, and I'm like, no. God, I'm an introvert. I can't do that. I don't speak well. I still had a real strong Indiana accent. Nobody understood half of what I said. So I said, God, I'll back them up. I'll pray for them. I'll be a support. And that's all I was willing to do. And guess what? It didn't work. I never felt fully satisfied. I was never fully happy. I just constantly was kind of struggling. You know why? Because I was trying to bottle up the living water. And it wasn't working. And there's many of us in this church that have done things like that. We're like, oh, yeah, I, I could, well, no. We'll let Josh do it. He's, he's, he's way more outspoken than I am, you know. And, and we'll just pray for him. I've got too much going on in my life. Um, they don't know I'm not as educated enough. I, I don't know how to pronounce all those words in the Bible. I, I can give you a book of lists uh, of excuses because, trust me, I've tried them. Um, most of them don't work. I've discovered that when you argue with God, just chop this one up. It's pretty much proven you're going to lose. Yep. You know? But if we're not striving for this moving of the Holy Spirit that he's asking us for, what have I become? I've become a sister. Because I'm breaking down the spring of living water, and when I break it down, the flow stops. I don't want that. Joel says this in chapter 2, verses 28 through 29. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and then your young men shall see visions. Also on my men's servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days. Who's excluded? <coughs> You're not. There's no excuse. The reality of it is, is the only thing that stops us from having the full vision and the full force of that vision in our life is because we don't want it. Amen? Amen? I mean, that's kind of harsh, and I, I, I'm sorry if that sounds harsh. But the reality of it is, is we're the ones that limit God. God's unlimited, Amen. except... When we put a restrictor on him in our life. And we need to be careful with that because if I want to see this community changed, if I want to see my neighbors saved, if I want to see my children and grandchildren saved, then there's something that must break forth in me to affect those around me. And that's what God's asking for us this morning. The last part of this is visions in action. In John chapter 17, verses 16 through 19, it says this. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. So here's the reality of what he's saying here. Jesus Christ has already done all the hard work. He's the one who went to the cross. He's the one that bore the stripes. He's the one who wore the crown of thorns. He's the one that had to be taken and accused and falsely accused. He's the one that had to go through all of the process of dying and being resurrected. He's the one that becomes the mediator before the very throne of God, pleading our case each and every time. How do I react to that? See the silence? That's how I react to it sometimes. And I need to take and have this enthusiasm in me that just begins to break forth and say, God, I want that revelation. I want that, that, that vision that stirs me to where I cannot stop. Being like the prophet that said, I can't quit speaking because there's a fire that's within my bones. There's something that begins to stir us to the point that it begins to break <laughs> forth as a flow that cannot be stopped. It cannot be contained, but it begins to pour forth. Amen. 
Okay. Because I want to see healings in the church, I begin to seek for healings in the church. If I want to see miracles in the church, I begin to seek for miracles in the church. I don't care who does it. I don't care where it comes from, but I have a vision that the body of Christ must become alive. It's not like any other church. Just because there's a name on the door doesn't mean anything. But I need a thriving, living body, breathing and flowing in the moving of the Holy Spirit. This is what stirs me. As I've traveled around and I go from church to church, I know the names over the door. I know the different denominations and I don't criticize any of them. But sometimes I walk in and I think and I realize that the trumpet blows, they're going first. Because they've been dead and just don't know it. You guys know what I'm saying? Yeah. You've been to those churches. You want to look at them and say, we love you, honey, but you need to pick a lily and lay down. You died a long time ago. I don't want to be that church. I want to be the church that's so vibrant that literally may be going to draw them from the highways and from the byways because there's something that connects to their hearts. You see, the reality in this day and age is people don't typically just show up at church. They come because they know somebody. They come because somebody else outside of the church has made a connection with them, and they come because of you. Or they avoid the church because of you. Amen? What is the vision that you have in your life? Jude says this in verses 17 to 21. But you, beloved, remember the words which were been spoken by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they said to you, in the last times there shall be mockers walking after their own godly lusts. These are they who make separation, sensual, having not the spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping yourself in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. What's he saying here? Understand the situation that we're at in this day and age. I, I've got to tell you, I, I minister to people all over the world as I connect with different pastors and stuff. Sometimes it's really interesting. We sometimes... What, what, what I run into is we get this mentality that this is Christianity. We put it into a box. We put a label on it. We say, here it is. Guess what? God's bigger than that. Amen. God is wanting to take and move in such a massive way. But until we, the members, the body of Christ, become like the living capillaries in a bloodstream, the body dies. And I don't want to be that part, do you? Now I got you guys all really quiet. But I hope it's because you're percolating in that brain of yours. What is my vision? God's calling me to do something. I've got to get busy. Because I've got to tell you, the day and time is short. Amen. I can tell you right now, as I study through revelations, as I study through the prophecies of the end times, we are watching the last of the leaves falling off of the trees. Some, I remember as a teenager, that used to scare me to death when they talked about that. Because the reality that today could be the day, are you ready for it? If we literally knew that today at 12 noon the trumpet was going to blow, what would you quickly do? Amen? Was your life, does it need to be set right? Is there somebody that you need to call and forgive right now? Is there somebody that you need to make something right with so that you can have the clarity of a vision of God in your life? Or are we still sitting as cisterns with the rats and the bugs and everything else sitting as scum in the bottom of our well, tainting the very water that's within us so that we do not have what is fresh to give out as the glory of God? Amen. Hopefully that wasn't too hard. But it's straight from my heart. Because I get challenged. I was griping to my wife the other day. I was, I was on Messenger with somebody over in the Philippines. And I'm working with them. And I'm with somebody in Cambodia. And I was with somebody in Uganda. And I'm going back and forth and back and forth. And they're all saying, hey, Pastor, we want you to come and, and preach at our church. We want you to come and do this in our church. And I'm, guys... 
when I don't have the money to travel to their churches. And I was grumbling. And Dinah says, Mark, did God call you to go to their churches? Well, no. She says, or did he call you to do what you're doing? You have to understand what I'm getting at. Sometimes we limit ourselves because we can't do this, when in reality, God has something great for us that's planned for us. Don't discount the vision that you have. Instead, run with it, with vigor. That's what God's calling us to. That's what I wanted to share with you. Now, we stand at the crux of the next decade. Where will you be at the end of this year? What do you want to see for the body of Christ here at the end of this year? What do you want to see for your own personal life at the end of this next year? It's really easy to write out New Year's resolutions, but I've got to tell you, usually by about January 20th, most of them don't even know what they were. But God has put into us an emphasis about what needs to be done this year. I don't know why, but there is something special about this year. And it's time to wake up and realize that what you put on Facebook and all your opinions doesn't matter if it doesn't glorify God. Whether it be Twitter or whatever social media you're on, if it's not glorifying God and loving people to salvation, stop it. Amen. I mean, I, I love our president and I love all the different stuff, but i got to tell you, sometimes we get more focused on that than we do about the Word of God, about salvation, about the very fact that we're going to watch people walk to hell. And it terrifies me that I may know some of those people. What is it that should come out of my mouth wherever I go? And I'm going to quit with that because I could go for a long time on this one. God has something for you. God has a ministry that he wants to instill in your life. Now, this, when I started this, I asked how many people wanted to see kids get te taught the Bible. Everybody raised their hand. That was easy. But then if I ask now, how many people are going to go in volunteer, you think the same number of hands would go up? Amen. You know why? There's a difference between an idea and reality. So this morning what I'm asking for is not an idea. I'm asking for a reality. And as we get ready to close in prayer, I'm going to open these altars up. And if you need a vision in your life, you come up here and pray. If you need to get something straight in your life so that you can get a vision from God, you're open to that. But I beg of you, do not leave this church dull and bored as Christians. Amen? Amen. But walk out of here as shined weapons of spiritual warfare. <coughs> because that's what God wants of you. We need to have something that's going to move us from where we are to where God wants us to be. Would you stand with me this morning? Go ahead and kick on some music back there. As we just close in prayer, I know some of you need to go. But I really do encourage you, find a place to pray. It doesn't have to be at the front. It can be wherever you're at. But ask God, where does he want you to be this year? Where does he want you to go? What does he want you to do? And make sure that you know it within your heart before you wander away. Can we do that this morning? God, as we come before you right now, God, we're just asking that you would guide us and direct us. God, you know the words that we've spoke this morning. And God, some of them are pretty direct. And God, they pierce to the very depths of our heart.